Welcome to a preview of The Red Bernous, Algeria 1857, a historical, educational deck building game. Thank you, Hit Em With A Shoe Games, for sending us a prototype copy of this game to check out. No other compensation was provided. So The Red Bernous, Algeria 1857, was designed by Roberta Taylor and Matt Schumacher. It featured very striking artwork from Essene Beblik and graphic design by Helen Schumacher. Kareem Usaris provided cultural consulting and editing was done by Nicole Amato. And I do apologize if I have any of those pronunciations wrong, which I probably do. Now, a crowdfunding campaign for the Red Bernouse will be launching on Kickstarter on September 14th with plans to have the game published in 2022. Now, this historic game can be played with one to four players with games taking between an hour and a half to an hour, give or take. Please note that this review is based off a prototype copy mm -hmm. of the Red Bernouse. The rules and production quality are subject to change. That said, at this point, the rules, board design, and card effects are complete and may only be upgraded in regards to clarity and usability. Now, in the Red Bernouse, Algeria 1857, you take on the role of a Kabyle leader in control of two to four villages and work with the other leaders to defend those villages from the invading French armies. This is a deck building game with you start with a set deck containing villagers, things like man, woman, child, and artisan, which you will use to play into your villages or use to purchase new cards like fig orchards, weapons, and Mohajadeen defenders. This is combined with cubes on a map style war game where you'll be placing and moving cubes representing your defenders on the board to stop the French advance, which is controlled by an automata deck. Now, combat is D6 based using a traditional war game combat results table. Now, due to this being a prototype, we don't have an unboxing video to share with you today, mm -hmm. as we expect the production copy to differ, uh, be different from this prototype in some ways. Now, in the box for what I did get, I had five different types of card decks, including four identical starter decks, like your typical deck building deck, eight leader cards, eight different types of recruitable cards, your market, nine village cards, and the French automata deck. Now, there are also four really useful reference cards with the turn sequence listed on one side and the combat results table, which I may start saying CRT instead of combat results table. So if you hear me say CRT, I mean combat results table on the other side. Other components include D6 dice and cubes for each army type, meeples to represent specific heroes, three pawns to represent the French armies moving around the board, wooden cylinders to represent defenses, and a small selection of tokens, including a retreat token, four submitted tokens, a number of reroll tokens, and three army start location tokens. Oh, well, that is quite a bit of stuff in there. Yeah. So I guess the next question I have from this is, do they make good use of all those components or is this going to be really crowded on the table? No, I find it worked out really well. Uh, it, it's just what you need. There, there isn't anything extra and there's a little, anything a little too little. Though I will admit now uh, the game came with everything in one big baggie. I Now that I have things separated into smaller baggies, it is much quicker to set up than the first couple times I played. Now, what I will say... Again, prototype, right? What I have as a prototype, I am certain this is going to be a very visually striking game. The artwork here is excellent. And I appreciate the fact they actually went with an, an Algerian artist for all of the artwork in the game. The board looks good. Uh, it's very effective during play, like plenty of room. The army spots to put the French armies are very clear where the villages are clear. There's no confusion over what routes things can take. None of the, the pitfalls I've seen with some other war games. My only complaint in regards to this so far is the card design, specifically the iconography. Uh, the iconography is very tiny and in black and white. And all they did is they put it black on white for resources you generate, black on red for resources you spend. And there are five different resources in the game and they really could have used to be color coded. Like food is green and Mohajadeen are white or something. Just some way to, because so, as it stands, you honestly can't see the cost from across the table. Though I will admit that after our third game or so, we had pretty much memorized all the costs because it is a static market game. Well, now that we have some idea of what you'll be getting with this cooperative historic deck building game, how about you give us an overview of how the game is played? All right, so you start off a game of the Red Bernouse, Algeria 1857, by determining which players will control which villages on the map. 
Now, this is based on player count. So depending on how many people you're playing with, you're each going to either own two to four villages. Now, players are going to take village cards for those villages along with one of the starter decks. The hero deck shuffled, and you're going to get dealt two heroes and pick one to add to your deck. The other gets removed from the game. So that does add some replayability. Players are then collect any additional starting cards. Now, this is based on the villages you got and the heroes. They may say you start with this, you start with that, you have a, a fig orchard, you have a mohajadate already. So you start with those. And you're going to also place cubes for any units you collect into the villages. So whenever you collect one of the, the cards that represent a unit, you also put a cube out on the board to show where that unit is. Now, the village cards are placed in front of the players. The rest of your cards, you shuffle and become your deck for this deck builder. So is there any asymmetry here or are all the villages similar? So each village does have its own unique ability on it or unique thing it does. Some give you starting things like one will start with, say, like a fig orchard. One will start with a market. The other thing is many of them affect when the French attack. So there are at least two villages that I know of that are high in the hills and hard to reach. So the French can't attack with cavalry. There are others that are well defended so that uh, artillery work works on them uh, and so on. So each of the different villages does have an ability, though I did notice there was some overlap. Like there were two villages that help against artillery and there are two that help against cavalry so there is some asymmetry with what villages you have now the three army start indicators so all these are as arrows are placed down because there are three french armies invading and what this does is that you don't know which army is going to come in on the board where and they are coming in through algeria's mountainous region so they are coming in through one of the three mountain passes you don't know which army is going to come in where which is actually really well done now initial units are added to these armies you're going to draw one card per player off the french deck now the french units come in four types there's artillery cavalry carabinier sappers are your four types artillery technically don't get placed this way they come up during french cards later that'll have you add artillery part way through the game now each of these unit types is represented by a different colored cube and a d6 die in that color now after placing units from this card you're going to draw card draw the army spots on the board have a what's called deploy value. If you get enough cubes on there, they deploy and go out in the map. It is possible at the start of the game, the first army might deploy. Where it deploys is that army start indicator that was randomized earlier. Now, note at this point, all the rest of the text on the French cards are ignored. All you're looking at is units. So it's just kind of like a setup at the beginning of the game. Now, the rest of the cards in the game form a static market of eight different cards. I'm not going to get into the detail of exactly what each of those are, but each has a cost at the bottom of the card, card text telling you what it does, and some cards also generate resources. Now, I did mention there are five resources in this game. There is food, influence, military power, tools, and weapons. So five resources for a deck builder is quite a bit, yes. considering most generally stick with two. Yeah, usually you have purchase power and attack power, if that. Yeah. Some even less. Yeah, this is definitely a different type of deck building game. So when you actually start playing, now that everything's set up, you determine start player. I don't remember if there was a silly rule for it. My bad. Uh, you're going to take three actions and then get to buy up to two cards. Now, after a set number of players act, based on the player count, the French will act. For four players, it's after every two players. So two players go the French, go two players, go the French player. If you're playing any other player count, this is after everyone. So if you're playing three players, all three players go, then the, the French. If you're playing two players, both players go, then the French. Now, the game ends in a French victory when either two players are eliminated due to losing a village or when one player has been forced to retreat and one player is eliminated. The players win if the Algerians can survive until the French deck runs out. Note, historically, this does not mean the Algerians win. It just means you lasted through this assault because, unfortunately, in real history, the French do end up conquering this entire territory. Sorry, pacifying this entire territory. Sadly, however, attrition has often been one of the only options available to yeah. those being invaded. So the actions you can take on your turn include play a card. Use the ability on the card. These are, if you play Dominion or other deck builders, this is your action abilities, right? These include things like being able to move your defenders around on the map, drawing additional cards, ambushing the French armies, and more. A card used this way cannot be used for purchasing later in the turn. Next is reserve. This is the most important part of this game, in my opinion. 
either place a card from your hand into one of your villages. Again, you have two to four of them or take all the cards in one village back to your hand. This is the most unique mechanic in this deck building game and really sets it apart from every other deck builder I've ever played. This gives you a ton of control over your deck in your hand. In addition to this, many of the starter cards have abilities that go off when you place them into a village. These abilities include drawing more cards, earning reroll tokens, moving cards between your villages and more. The final action option, which you can do these in any order and multiple times if you wish, is mobilize. This lets you move your units, note not your heroes, from one village you control to another village you control. It's interesting to use the board as a card management solution. And I certainly can't think of uh, anything I've run across that does anything similar. Um, and on top of that, it, it feels like it's connected to the game. Yeah. Like it, it feels like it makes sense. It's not just a cool mechanism that, did, yes. that someone decided to add in. I totally agree. So one thing, just to make it clear, in case you're not picturing this right, you don't actually play your cards onto the board villages. You have cards to represent the villages. So you're placing your cards on top of your village cards right. because what would clutter the board otherwise. But the effect is you are putting things into play. Right. Now, after completing up to three actions, you then use your remaining cards to recruit new cards. Now, each card can provide up to three different resources, and you add them all together. So you take all the cards that left in your hand and add up all those resources. You can then use those to buy two cards from the static market. Now, what's interesting here is the distribution of resources in the cards and what you need to buy each of them. Again, I'm not going to describe every card. It'd take way too long, but seven of the eight cards require influence. All of the units that you put on the board require food. Weapons are particularly hard to buy at the beginning of the game because they require tools, and your starter deck only has one artificer that has tools. So you can kind of see how the villagers need to band together and work together to even start making a defense. So rather than the all too common throw down all your cards, sum up your resources, draw, spend, spend or attack, and you're done, the actions are separate from yes. that purchasing phase. Yeah, completely separate phase of the game. Now, two of the recruitable cards represent units. These are the Mohajadeen and the Sharpshooters. When you get one of these cards, you're gonna place a cube on the map to represent that unit. Then the card goes into your deck. Now, when these cards come up in your deck, they generate resources, but they can also be discarded with weapons to ambush the French. And I specifically call this out because this is something you are going to want to do as often as you can. In an ambush, you select any number of units to participate from one single village and a French army to attack. You have to have a clear path to this army that doesn't pass through any other villages. You then roll a die for each of your units taking part in the ambush and check the CRT to see if you generate hits. Rerolls can be spent, one token per die, and for each hit, you get to remove a French unit of your choice. The French then counterattack. But because this is a guerrilla ambush, they only attack with a number of units equal to half the size of the force you ambushed with, or the number of French units, whichever is lower. Again, hits are calculated based on the CRT. Reroll tokens can be used here as well. So you can reroll the opponent's dice as well. Now, units are lost based on the order showed on the CRT. So the French take casualties, or you take casualties in a set order. Finally, once both sides have taken casualties, you see if the French army has been reduced below its retreat limit. And if it has, it goes back down to the bottom of the board, possibly to redeploy later in the game. If there are any units in the reinforcement area at this time, they're added to the army, which I need to mention because we'll get to reinforcements later. Those reinforcements could cause that French army to redeploy immediately. So this is quite the war game and yeah. certainly more of one than I expected when I heard deck builder mm -hmm. uh, with quite a tactical component yes. uh, to this game. Yeah, this is definitely a war game masked with a deck building game. It may not have hexes and counters, but there is a lot of war game roots here. Now, again, I mentioned once a set number of players take their actions, the French go. So the way the French go is you flip the top card of the automata deck and the units indicated on the card are added to the lowest undeployed French army. And if all the armies are deployed, it gets put into the reinforcements. So those are those ones that would back up the army if they retreat. The deploy number in each army is now checked, the undeployed one, to see if you now beat it. So if there's enough cubes there to meet or beat that number, that army will deploy. The same way I mentioned earlier, you're going to flip over the thing and see which army they come in. And no, you don't put the cubes all on the map. That would be a mess. Instead, they just give you a pawn. And the pawn represents the army where the cubes are all at the bottom. 
Next, any text on the French card is followed. Again, I'm not going to get to all the details, but it can do things like add cannons to the French armies that are already deployed, cause players to discard cards. Uh, the French were famous for burning down the orchards and destroying markets and more. Then all the French armies move. This follows a pretty simple set of, I know people like to call it AI rules. I don't know, whatever. They, they follow a set of guidelines. In general, the French always move towards the closest unconquered village. If there are ever two equidistant villages, there's symbols on the map, and the army will move towards the symbol that matches what's showing on the phrase up card. Pretty simple. So while it's called automata, it's really not, as it doesn't actually have any processes, huh. except you're flipping the top card of a shuffled deck. Yeah, that's correct. And I actually, I, I have suggested to the the designer to remove the whole automata because to me that makes it sound like a robot and something foreign. Just call it the French. It's French armies that are acting. And it, to me, dehumanizes the French where in a game with this that's so poignant, I think just calling it the French all the way through would actually have more of an impact. Now, if the French reach a village, the first thing they'll have to deal with is any defenses built. Now, these this is defenses is one of the recruitable cards, and they're represented on the board with purple cylinders. This again may change. Now, first, sappers cancel out defenses. So French sappers cancel out defenses one to one, removing both from the map. If any defenses remain, the French lose one unit per defense that's still left and have to stop just outside the village. Now they will move in to attack next turn, unless more defenses can be built. Then they have to go through this again. Now, if the French aren't stopped by defenses, a battle happens. Now, all combats resolve by rolling a d6 and referencing the combat results table. Now, unlike ambushes, though, there's a very distinct order to the combat with casualties having to be resolved in a certain order, unlike getting to pick who you killed when you're ambushing. So first, French cannons fire. Then the Algerian troops attack back. Then the French counterattack. After casualties are taken from all those steps, you see if the French army retreats, as described earlier. Then the Algerian player, if they haven't been wiped out, has the option to retreat. The thing is, based on historical facts here, the Algerians can only retreat once during the entire game. So if someone else has already retreated, you have to fight to the finish. Also, in a really brilliant, in my opinion, thematic uh, tie-in here, Algerian troops will not retreat from a village that contains any child or youth cards in it. The first and only time a player chooses to retreat, you're going to put a token on that village to show that you've retreated. You're going to discard any cards located in the village you retreated from and then move any retreating units to another one of your villages. Give a colonist an inch and they'll take a mile. Now, if a player ever loses a battle, because what happens if no one retreats, you just keep fighting until one side's wiped out. If you lose one battle, just one battle, you're removed from the game. All of your Muhajideen units join the French army that conquered them, and a submitted token is placed on each of your villages. From then on, you're out of the game. Note, if either two players are eliminated or a player is eliminated after the recruit token is already in play, the players just lose. Game continues until either the French deck is emptied or the players lose. It's not hard to find the depressing realism in this game, but it's an important topic that is all too often looked at from the other side mm -hmm. of history. And now that we have a rough idea of how to play, how about you share some of your thoughts on the Red Burnings? What did you think of this war game deck builder mashup? So I love discovering a game that's doing something new and different. And that's what we have here with the Red Burnings. Here we have a game that takes static market deck building where you're not changing up. It's always the same cards for sale every round and combines it with traditional war game elements. Well, also making it a cooperative game. You don't get a lot of cooperative war games out there, and you're playing the indigenous people resisting the colonists instead of the colonizers. And I love everything about that. Yeah, there is a lot going on here. Now, the theme in the Red Burnus really stands out. So included with my prototype was a historical reference that I assume will be included with the full game that describes the various French incursions into Algeria, which started in the 1830s. It details the valiant efforts of the Algerians in holding back the French conquerors and particularly the role of Lala Fatma Sumer, one of the leaders of the Algerian resistance movement and one of the most well-known Algerian heroes who is also female, which is notable. And this is the sort of history that sadly is not being taught in our schools. 
And I have to say, the first time I played this game and I picked up my starter deck and I looked at it, it just kind of hit home. Your starter deck in this game is a deck building game. Everyone starts the same thing, has two men, two women, two young men, two young women, a youth, a child, an old man, and an artisan. Those are your cards. This is your starting army in this game. These are your forces. Meanwhile, before the game bins, begins, you can already see the French army building up with its carabinier, cavalry, and artillery. The reality of colonization. These fathers' forces weren't bothering with fair battles. No. They were here for the easy win. And even that weird rule that once you lose one fight, you're eliminated from the game is actually based on historic fact. The way your troops join the French is based on historic fact. The Algerians used what was called the SAF system, S-A-F-F, of alliances between the, the Caballet tribes. The French took advantage of this due to the fact that if one SAF was defeated, every tribe in that SAF was also forced to surrender immediately. Added to that, the people in that tribe then had to follow the French and turn their rifles on the remaining independent tribes. And the game represents this with that player elimination rule where if you just lose one battle. Sorry, you're now on the French side. And unfortunately, you don't really run out of the utter evil that has been done by colonizing peoples when you sit down and look for it. I also found that placing your cards individuals into villages feels very thematic, right? Like you end up filling your villages with men, women, and children in order to bolster your forces. You store food in a village you hope the French won't conquer so you can bring it out when you need it. And then there's, of course, that thematic rule that you can't retreat if your village has youth or children in it. All really well tied in. And this ability to place cards on your table out of your deck and into a village is the most unique, interesting part of this deck building. The mechanics, looking at not the thematic side, but the mechanical side of the Red Burners. We very quickly learned just how powerful that reserve action can be. It lets you do things like place weapons in a village so that you can take them out when you need them later. It lets you build up a lot of influence in one place so that you can purchase some high-powered cards. You can also set up combos where you pick up cards from a village just to put them back in again to draw more cards to earn reroll tokens. While I admit that may not be as thematic as other amounts of the game, it is a really neat system. And there's some eureka moments when first playing about how, wait, if I, there's no French on the board right now, but if I store a Mohajadin here with some weapons, I can pull them out later to do an ambush when I need it. Like just discovering that that's part of the mechanisms of the game was very rewarding. And at the root for all the education and reality, uh, harsh reality that this game brings to the table it is still a game, and yep. with that come certain systems that will and can play out within the mechanisms used for the game. Yeah. Another thing I did appreciate is cooperation is key to winning the Red Bernus. The French have three different armies coming in through three different mountain passes, all basically surrounding your villages. While each army deploys one at a time, you never know where the first two are going to come on the map. This makes it hard to build up defenders because you don't know where you're going to need them, which leads to lots of player interaction working together to move defenders where they're needed, sometimes at literally the very last minute. And something I didn't mention in the rule summary is another big aspect of play is that almost everything in this game is in limited supply. There are only so many weapon cards in play. There are only so many sharpshooters you recruit. And there's only 12 reroll tokens that have to be shared by all the players. Do this, you have to watch out for hoarding. Like usually you play a game like this and you just want to buy the best thing for you every turn, but you don't want one player building all the defenses so no other player can defend their villages or having someone put out all the Mahajadines, which are even more powerful troops that can't be moved. Not a game where you want to split up the different tasks then. Everyone needs to share everything and deal with the invasion as a unified people. Correct. Now the automata system for the French works well. Uh, the rules make it very clear how the French army deploys, how they act when they deploy, when they retreat. Though these are some of the most complicated rules in the game, the most fiddly bits, so it may take some rereading. Just be sure to take everything you read in the rules, literally. It's all there. You might have to read it a couple times to note the idiosyncrasies, but every time I had a rule question, the answer was in the book. It just took some rereading to get to. Now, next, we're going to get into some of the potential pitfalls of this as a game. Yeah. So one of the things that may turn people off this game is its reliance on dice. This is more of a thematic dice chucker than a Euro game. This is a D6 driven war game after all, and conflicts are determined by rolling D6 and looking up at the results on a table. The table indicates which French units act first during a counterattack. 
the number of hits caused on what rules, and the order casualties must be taken for both sides. Now, each unit type in the game is completely different from others. For example, the French cannons only hit on a five or six, but do two hits on a six. Algerian sharpshooters actually hit on a three or higher, but only ever do one damage and so on. Earning reroll tokens before going into a battle is a must in this game to help offset the vagaries of the dice. But remember, the supply of those tokens is limited, so make sure one player doesn't hoard them all. And another note that's really important in this is the French armies don't run out. Your Algerian, when you lose a cube off the board, it is removed from the game, never to be recruited again, where the French just keep coming. Yeah, while there is no question there is an element of randomness in war, all your plans go out the window when shooting starts, after all. That is often a huge turnoff yeah. for some players. Now, the other thing I do want to talk about is the difficulty level of the Red Burn. So I expect cooperative games to be hard. I really do. I expect them to be very difficult. You shouldn't win every time, or even the majority of times when playing a co-op to me. I find that the most fun cooperative games are the ones where you get really close to winning. Like you're almost there. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel and you fail. And it leaves you with that. We are so close. Let's play again. Let's try again. We've got to do it. That to me is what makes Pandemic such a big hit. Unfortunately, the Red Bernus hasn't quite found that perfect balance. And that balance is widely affected by the player count. At two players in particular, using the rules as written, we fed the, found the Red Bernus was far too easy. We haven't lost a game yet. And we've been able to call the games a few turns before the end because there's no way the French would ever even be able to reach our villages. So like, yeah, there's three turns left, but they'd have to move four spots to even reach us. As long as there's not a move double card in the deck, and we know there's not because we've already seen all of them, they can't even win. And in almost every game we played two-player, once it happened, the third army never even deployed because we just kept ambushing them and sending the other armies retreating. So they just keep, first two armies would keep coming out. Now I did note this to the designer. The first thing he said is you're obviously experienced co-op players. We do find the game, if people are good at co-op games and good at working together, it can be too easy. And well, Deanna and I play a lot of games together. So yes, we probably qualify as being good at cooperative games. Um, I What he then suggested, and I suggest put in some sliders, put in some stuff to make the game more difficult. So the first thing he recommended was have the French player go after each turn. And that turned this into a real game. That made things a real challenge. Now, we've still won every time we've used it this way, but we have had to retreat, and there were definitely battles where if the dice didn't go our way, it was over. So I strongly recommend if you were going to play two-player, use this um, variant way to play. So it's interesting to see it work this way, as often one will find the opposite, yeah. where higher counts uh, are what makes things easier. Yeah, I think it's, again, it's how often the French get to act before something happens. Now, with three players, by the proper rules, this is all three players go, then the French go. It was definitely tenser than two. All three French armies did manage to hit the board, and there were some tight battles near the beginning of the game. I, in one game, we did have to have someone retreat. But by the time we got past the halfway point of the game, by the time most of us had improved our decks, and while we realized that we shouldn't be hoarding the uh, reroll tokens and make sure they go to the people who are actually going to face the French, the French really didn't stand a chance. Now, what I will say is four players is where this game shined. Here, we finally found the tension I expect to find in a cooperative board game. Things start tense and never easy. Every victory founds, feels like it was fought for, and numerous times, battles came down to a die roll or two. And to be honest, at this point, we've lost every game we played with four. But we always felt like we had a chance, that we could have done something better. We could have distributed something better. Or we should have made the defenses higher here. Now, what I do know, and this is a very good thing, in my prototype, this doesn't exist, but I do know a sliding difficulty scale will be something included in the production co-op of this game. Uh, the various sliders that the designer has mentioned to me is what I already mentioned with how often the French can act. Removing your village abilities. So when Sean asked earlier if they're asymmetric, yes, every village has something that it does. Removing those, and then finally removing the hero abilities. With all three of these options, you should be able to tweak the game to make it enjoyable not only at different player counts, but to keep it challenging as you learn to master the game. Because I will say we played much better in our fifth game than we did in our first game, especially getting used to that whole being able to put cards in the village mechanic. 
It's good to see plans are already in the work to compensate for potential perceived flaws in that pre-production version. I know it's interesting. Uh, you talk about the French acting um, delayed by however many turns when in so many games uh, you'll see that that, that opponent, the, the, the game acts against you at the beginning of every turn. Yes. Uh, which is again why why more players is often worse. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to play it for players with the French acting every turn. I think that would be extremely overwhelming, <laughs> at least based on our experiences so far. Now, my only other complaint about this game is based on my prototype copy is the current card design. Um, I already mentioned the clarity of the resource icons, how they could be color coded, and made bigger. The other thing is the same where card designers like to put the card name and the stuff it does in the middle. And I think this is just like a holdover to Magic the Gathering. Like you want card art, then rule text, and then, or sorry, then, you know, resources. And then at the bottom, you have your, your text. They're currently, everything's in the middle of the card. And I strongly suggested to the designer that they move them to the top or the bottom. And all that's for is when you're placing cards in your village, because I want to be able to stack my cards so that I can either show the top or the bottom so I can see what resources those cards generate. So I know I want to pick them up when to go shopping. with. Again, a minor quibble, but it'd be nice to have them slightly redesigned. Yeah, it's often how how uh, dot how often games do this because there are really only so many ways one holds, plays, or stacks cards, and none of them expose the middle of the card. Yeah, I, I'm not sure where that started. Like I said I picture magic cards, but like the whole put the block of text here, just the, put it at the bottom of the top. Now, another improvement I would like to see though, again, this is pretty minor, is a way to track the five resources. So again, you got five resources you're generating when you're, when you're going shopping with your cards. And you get two purchase actions. And each card, some generate three different resources. So we actually found we were spending a lot of time trying to figure out how much we had to spend each turn, especially after buying something. So it was, it was just a little noise like, all right, so I have six influence and four warfare and two food and a weapon and a tool. What's a Mohajadeen cost? Okay, it costs four influence and four what? Wait, what did I? Okay, wait, no, I have four weapons and I have, wait, where's my influence? Okay, there's my influence. All right, I buy that, I put a cubo. All right, now how much influence can I afford a fake thing? Wait, no, I already used that. You can kind of see how that thought process. I would like some way to track that. Yeah, indeed. Well, in games with two resources, the sort of more standard deck builder, I often find when they do include counters to track the resources, completely extraneous. Yeah. Uh, there are so many games where you've, they've got tokens there, but unless you're, you know, storing them up between turns, you never even touch them. You just put your cards mm -hmm. down and say, I got six to spend. What am I going to buy? Uh, but when you have five resources, that's not yeah. something most people can keep in their head. Yeah, they said minor quibble. I, it's not a bad thing, but it would be nice to have some kind of tracker. I don't know if that'll make the final copy, but if it does and you appreciate it, you can thank me. <laughs> now, something else I do want to note, right? We've been talking about this. Sean's mentioned how involved this game is and how much of a war game it actually is. Don't let that scare you away. This is not a big, heavy, long war game with lots of rules presented C section 3.16 C. There's no terrain types and combat modifiers. You don't have to worry about hex sides. This is actually one of the lightest war games I've actually played. But that's not to say it's a light game. This isn't a gateway game, and it does assume you're already familiar with the basics of deck building. To me, this falls in that medium weight game, possibly leaning a bit towards heavy, especially designed for semi-experienced players. I, I would not throw this down as someone's first deck building experience or someone's first war gaming experience. Well, there you have it. We'll see where it lands on the weight scale once it gets into more people's hands. Overall, I have to say I'm very impressed by the Red Bernoose Algeria 1857. This is a very cool new way to use the deck building mechanic and combine it with many elements of a traditional war game. The setting that was chosen is a fascinating one, and I love the fact you're fighting against the colonizers and not the other way around. This game did what a good historical game should do and got me to actually do some research on my own about the Algerian Revolution, and I greatly appreciated the historical references that were included in the game. I'm very impressed by how well they're tied to the mechanics of the Red Bernus as well. I haven't even played the game yet, and yet I still spend a good chunk of time deciphering nearly legible French scrawl <laughs> from an artist's work from the period. If you love deck building games and want to see something new, something totally new being done with it, the, the, the classic mechanic of deck building, check this game out. Check out the Red Bernoos. The whole ability to store cards on the table 
only to pick them up and use them when you need them is something I would love to see more people use. Like build off this. I want to see more games using this mechanic. I want to see a future deck builder using this, perhaps in a slightly less depressing setting. If you're a history buff or perhaps a history teacher, this is a great game for showcasing this particular period of history, which started with the French pacification, sorry, invasion of Algeria in 1830. The way the theme is tied to the mechanics could make for a great teaching tool, and the included historical reference is fascinating enough that it actually got me doing additional research. If you're a war game fan, you may want to check this game out. It's definitely not your traditional hex encounter game, but it does use some mechanics you'll find familiar, like a combat resolution table. If you like your war games long, heavy, and detailed, this probably isn't the game for you. Now, as for everyone else, I suggest you give this game a look. Take, do some research, listen to the full review, maybe watch some videos. There isn't anything out there right now quite like this, and to me, that alone is an achievement. While the difficulty level could use a bit of tweaking, I found a lot to like in this historic deck building war game. Well, that's it for our look of a prototype copy of the Red Bernoose Algeria 1857. Remember that this game launches on Kickstarter on September 14th. As always, we welcome you to check out Mo's written review of the game in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com.